the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. I hadn't planned on saying anything about this, but now I think I am going to say something about this. About the epistle reading that we read just now. This epistle reading tells a very interesting story. Because we hear that the apostles are going to a place in order to pray. And as they're on their way, a slave girl meets them. And this slave girl, it turns out, is possessed by a demon. And so she starts following after the apostles, following behind them. And as they're walking along the way to get to the place of prayer, this demon-possessed slave girl is saying loudly, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Already, this story should seem a little bit strange to some of you. Because this woman is possessed by a demon, and she's following behind the apostles, very loudly saying something that is absolutely true. She's saying, these men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. She's right. She's saying something that is absolutely true. And yet she's saying it in a loud way. She's saying it maybe to people who don't want to hear it. She's saying it in a way, we read, Paul was annoyed. She's saying it in a way that is annoying. And so we learn from this story that sometimes even speaking the truth if we're doing it at the wrong time, if we're doing it in the wrong way, if we're doing it without any care for the person who's listening to us, if we're doing it in a way that's annoying, Scripture tells us, even then, that can be the work of the devil. We have to be very mindful of that as Christians because sometimes we have a tendency to think we know what's true, everybody else doesn't know what's true, and so our job is just to speak the truth all the time, and of course our job is to speak the truth. But if we're speaking the truth in a way that doesn't have any concern, any care, any love for the person who we're speaking to, then we're not doing God's work at all. Again, I hadn't planned on saying anything about that, but I thought I would. Today we have the story in our Gospel reading of Christ healing the man born blind. Something that amazes me about this story, similar to what we heard before, when we heard about Jesus healing the paralytic, is that in both of those acts of healing, Jesus is the one who takes the initiative. Jesus doesn't wait for these people who are sick, these people who are afflicted, to come up to him and say, what can you do to help us? Instead, he sees that they're suffering. And as soon as he sees that they're suffering, he takes the initiative. He goes up to them and takes that first step. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus sees this man born blind. And some of the church fathers, John Chrysostom in particular, wrote that when Scripture tells us that this man was blind from birth, that this is in a way kind of a euphemism for saying he was born without having any eyes at all. I looked this up, there's a medical condition, very rare, a medical condition called anophthonia, from Greek, having no eyes, anophthonia, no eyes. A very rare congenital disorder in which a baby is born missing either one eye or in some very rare cases both eyes. Well, this man was blind from birth. He was born having no eyes. He was born in a way missing something. He was born in a way disfigured, in a way incomplete. 
because he was missing something that is so essential to, at least for most of us, to our functioning as human beings. He's a man who's ill. He's a man who is suffering because of his illness. And we know, of course, or at least we should know, some people get confused about this, that illness and suffering are not what God wants for us. Illness and suffering are not part of God's plan for his creation. What God wants for us is for us to be healthy, for us to be whole. And that's the way he created us. If you look in the book of Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve, he creates them in a state of health. He creates them in a state of wholeness, a state of well-being. And we see in Scripture that illness, suffering, and death come into the world as a result of sin. They come into the world because of sin, which is not what God wanted for his creation. Sin disfigures creation. And illness, suffering, and death are the results of this disfigurement of creation that has come into the world because of sin. Now the apostles, seeing this blind man, misinterpret that spiritual truth, the fact that illness, suffering, and death come into the world because of sin, the apostles, in a way, misinterpret, and so do the Pharisees later in the story. They misinterpret that truth to mean that an individual's illness is a result of some sin that they committed, or some sin that their parents committed, maybe. The apostles see this blind man, and they say, who sinned? This man or his parents? But he was born blind. Well, it couldn't have been his parents, because children aren't punished for the sins of their parents. This is right in the Scripture, even in the Old Testament, we read in the book of Ezekiel, the words, Son of man, why do you say this parable among the children of Israel? The parents have eaten unripe grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord, let this parable no longer be spoken in Israel. Kind of a strange saying, but if a parent eats sour grapes, does the children pucker up? Does the child pucker up his lips and say, oh? No, of course not. <coughs> Parents have eaten unripe grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord, let this parable no longer be spoken in Israel says the book of Ezekiel. Each person is responsible for their own sins, not someone else's. So it couldn't be the parents of this blind man who sinned, and because of their sin he was born blind. Couldn't be that. But it couldn't be that man's sins either, because he was born that way. He was born blind. He was blind from birth before he had an opportunity to sin in any way whatsoever. And so Jesus hears this question from the apostles, who was it that sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, it was not that this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God might be manifest in him. Now I want to say sometimes we tend to make the exact same mistake that the apostles made. We tend to make the exact same mistake that the Pharisees made later in the story. We also tend to see people who are suffering in some way and think to ourselves, if we don't say it out loud with our, with our lips, we think to ourselves, what did this person do wrong that resulted in their suffering? What sin was it that this person committed that now they're suffering? Whenever we see a person who's suffering, we're very quick to blame that person, which is easy. It's easy to blame a person who's suffering. Instead of showing compassion on that person, 
which is hard. Showing compassion is difficult. Casting blame is easy. We see a homeless person on the side of the street, and we say, oh, well, you wouldn't be on the streets if you weren't addicted to this or that drug. You wouldn't be on the streets if only you would go and get a job. We see a person who's suffering, and we're very quick to cast blame on that person. We see someone who's in an abusive relationship, and we say, well, you wouldn't be in this situation if you would stop making the same bad decisions all the time. Even sometimes we see people who are sick with just physical illness, and we say to them, you would never have gotten sick if only you had faith. Those are words that no Christian should ever say. Jesus says to the apostles, it was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the power of God might be made manifest to him. It was not my will, says Jesus, for mankind to sin. It was not my will for mankind to suffer. It was not my will for mankind to fall prey to sickness and death. It was not my will for this man to be born blind. Nonetheless, says Jesus, in my providence, I will work with mankind in all of its brokenness, in all of its hurt, in all of its suffering, for its healing, so that the glory of God might be revealed. We know that as human beings, Every one of us, every single human being, without exception, is made in the image and likeness of God. That's a basic theological fact of our faith. Every human being, without exception, is made in the image and likeness of God. And that means that each and every human life, without exception, has absolutely immeasurable value. But because of sin, the likeness of God that each of us has, has been disfigured in a way. So that we look at our fellow human beings, and so often we fail to see the presence of God in our neighbor. We fail to see the presence of God in our friend. We fail to see especially the presence of God in our enemy. Sin has disfigured the likeness of God, not the image of God, but the likeness of God. And one of the tragic consequences of this disfigurement that comes from sin is that so often we fail to recognize that an absolutely immeasurable value that each human being has. That disfigurement that comes through sin is healed through the glory of God. When we work together with him toward our salvation, I say here together because look what happened in today's gospel reading. As we said earlier, Jesus takes the initiative. Jesus comes up to this man who was born blind. But he doesn't snap his fingers and say, you're healed. Could have. That's not what he does though. What does he do? He spits in the ground, in the dirt. He makes clay from the dirt. He wash, he, he anoints the man's eyes with this clay and tells him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He gives this man a little bit of work to do for his own healing. God wants us to work together with him. God takes the initiative, but we have to be responsive to what God wants to do in our lives. We work together with God for our own healing, for our own salvation. And so whatever might be in your past, even if it's something that you've been struggling with, dealing with, from as long ago as you can remember, God is calling you to work together with him for your healing, so that you could say, along with the man born blind, Lord, I believe, 
Christ is risen. Who is risen? Amen.